Good evening. I'm honored to be here, and the theme that I will address tonight is living and dying at the crossroads, racism, embodiment, social justice, and public health. Whether it is our proposition that police killings and police deaths be counted as public health data so as to increase the accountability and the likelihood of prevention, or a reminder that Jim Crow is with us still as embodied history since every person born in the U.S. before 1965, that is age 65 and 50 and older, was born when Jim Crow was the law of the land in 21 U.S. states with their birth conditions affecting not only their adult health status and mortality, but their children's health as well. Or our studies between explicit and implicit measures of exposure to racial discrimination, racialized economic segregation, and adverse health status. The larger thesis is that the primary drivers of these health inequities are to be found within our body politic, not within our bodies. At issue are biological expressions of societal conditions, not innate characteristics that govern our fate. Health inequities, by definition, can be prevented because they are unfair, unnecessary, and unavoidable. And avoidable. Before saying a bit more about these examples, let me step back and offer five reasons a crossroads is an apt conceit for those of us who are working to expose and rectify health inequities within and between countries and regions in our troubled world. First, crossroads, as we have heard, can refer to being inter- or transdisciplinary. And while my work is grounded in epidemiology, that is the study of determinants and distributions of health and disease in populations, I draw extensively on other disciplines, including history, biology, sociology, psychology, statistics, philosophy of science, to name a few. Second, crossroads, by definitions, imply and create boundaries. And my work, like all work in the population sciences, confronts thorny conceptual questions about social and spatial boundaries, such as defining who and what makes populations, for example, in relation to race, ethnicity, social class, gender, sexuality, or nationality, as well as who and what makes, for example, neighborhoods or even nations. Third, crossroads involve junctures and journeys, and for me in social epidemiology, the historically contingent juncture of the societal, biological, and ecological is central to how I conceptualize embodiment, which is a core construct of the eco-social theory of disease distribution I've been developing since 1994. By embodiment, I mean how people literally embody biologically the multi-level societal and ecologic context in which we live, work, love, play, fight, ail, and die thereby creating population patterns of health and disease and well-being within and across historical generations. Of note, the main metaphor of ecosocial theory evokes crossroads because it is fractal and involves two sets of dynamic, intertwined, branching structures that span from macro to micro. One is the ever-evolving tree, or rather bush, of life. The other is the scaffolding of society that different societal groups daily seek to reinforce or alter via strengthening or challenging the status quo. Imagine, for example, a vine weaving its way in and out across the surface of a chain link fence and see that self-same structure repeated at myriad scales and levels from global to subcellular. The plethora of crossroads should be apparent as should how societal conditions shape options for organisms and species to thrive or perish. Fourth, crossroads are by definition branch structures, a form critical for understanding probabilities and my work grapples with the interplay of structure and chance as they jointly shape individual risk and population rates of disease. It is no accident that a predilection for playing with chance and contingency is a key feature of the myriad gods, goddesses, and mythical figures associated with or worshipped at the crossroads, whether Hermes and Hecate in ancient Greece, Eshu among the Yoruba in Nigeria and his counterparts worldwide among the slavery-driven African diaspora. Loki in the Nordic realms, or coyote and raven among different North American indigenous peoples. Fifth and finally, the work of social epidemiologists is itself located at the crossroads of science and society. I mean this in two ways. The first refers to the social production of science and the social responsibilities of scientists. Notably, the field-shaking 1931 conference compendium that introduced Marxist analysis to the field of history and science technologies was called science at the crossroads. The second refers to how societal change alters the very phenomena we study and the scientific problems we need to solve. And here another classic comes to mind. The 1926 article by C.E.A. Winslow titled Public Health at the Crossroads, initially presented as a presidential oration for the American Public Health Association, 
and which broke new ground by analyzing the public health, medical, and social implications of the U.S. and European decline in infectious disease mortality rates and the corresponding growing burdens of chronic, noncommunicable, and somatic and mental ailments. In closing, let me return to my examples of how a crossroads consciousness pervades them. First, in the case of law enforcement-related mortality, my work in improving monitoring of health inequities was what led me to ask last year, why is the number of people killed in the, by the police in the United States an official mystery? In public health, after all, we routinely count dead people. That's what we do, quantify and monitor mortality rates. By bringing a public health lens to an issue long treated as a matter solely of criminal justice, my team and I were able to propose an alternative approach to conceptualize and count these deaths as public health data using our already existing world-class notifiable condition reporting system that can report such events in real time and make for better accountability. And this proposal is beginning to gain some traction. Second, in the case of my studies analyzing racial ethnic inequities as biological expressions of racism, my use of his co-social theory formed by diverse disciplines is what has enabled me to challenge dominant, historical, and decontextualized biomedical and lifestyle approaches, which rely on biological determinism and methodological individualism to locate causes of disease allegedly in individuals' innate genetic constitution and quote-unquote personal tastes. The alternatives? To see population patterns of health, disease, and well-being in societal context as embodied history revealing the workings of structured chance in our jointly biophysical and social world, a crossroads if ever there were one, as underscored by the emergency of global climate change, its impact already widening health inequities. All of us here tonight, like people everywhere, are born, live, and die at the crossroads. To alter the odds of who ails and dies, of what conditions, at what age, requires concerted conscious action to change the course of these roads. History suggests this can be done for good and also for ill. Reactionary politics and policies can magnify health inequities. Progressive policies and politics can eliminate them. Consider only the example we have now of Flint, Michigan, the travesty of generation of children and others poisoned by lead due to a craven government. We need to understand that these are the crossroads at which we presently stand. Thank you.